Welcome to Echelon's um, She Slays edition. Today we're going to be talking about something very fun, but also something that we've not always heard. Um, we'll be speaking about how to slay your imposter, which is a topic that we've kept, I think, hidden in the closet, even though we see it um, every now and then. But this is a topic that uh, I think is happening to maybe most of us, but also we don't know. Um, let me start by introducing the panelists that I have. I have two lovely ladies and I am so excited that we have a gentleman on the panelists. So we'll start with Dananjay Hetiarachi. He's uh, an HRD specialist and a coach. Uh, then we'll move on to Nisreen uh, Ramanji. She is the head of corporate finance, food tax, um, and social entrepreneurship project at John Keel's uh, group. And we have Nikoli Vikramasinghe, who is the CEO of Capital Trust Properties. So, um, let me start by talking about a little bit on uh, the imposter syndrome, because I do know that most of you guys had to do a little bit of searching. Uh, a little bit of reading and I'm pretty sure you know about this a little bit because you handle a lot of uh, I, I think it will come out a little wrong if I say you handle a lot of women and men but uh, <laughs> <laughs> keeping it in light uh, trying to see or trying to understand what's an imposter syndrome so let me just phrase a little bit here so our viewers whoever is going to be seeing this uh, would know what it is basically it is when you start self-doubting yourself and you have these questions about whether you should be here or is it just luck that has brought you into this framework and if it is um, a question where we would want to sit down and ask there are like famous fours around it where you can really see anxiety and you can see yourself being the perfectionist you can also see fear of you know uh, failure where you just fear that you know you fail in something and you would not want to take risks um, and lack of confidence. So let's start with you, uh, Dhananjaya. I'd like to know, is it something to do with lack of confidence or is it just, you know, a conversation that you just build up in your head and you're just thinking um, as a business leader, how would it be for a person that you would be coaching? Yeah, so uh, that's a very, very interesting question. I think, you know, at a very base level, the imposter syndrome is a sense of undeservingness. You don't feel like you deserve uh, what you have. And it could be your identity in society, it could be uh, you know, the social narrative that's around you, your accomplishments. So general sense of kind of undeservingness. And, you know, there's a common misconception that, you know, people who are not successful have an imposter syndrome, right? It's not the case. If you look at the bell curve of performance, now I work with, you know, the top 0.01% of performance in different fields, they still have this feeling of undeservingness. And I think it doesn't have, a, well, in some cases, imposter syndrome leads to a lack of confidence in the latter part. If you're starting out your career, so on and so forth. But once you go to the top 10% of your profession, it's not about confidence. It's about, uh, you know, do I really want to do this? It manifests in different ways as opposed to a lack of confidence. Uh, am I worthy of this award? Am I worthy of this honor? Am I worthy of setting foot on this spectrum? So I think it depends on where you are in your career and uh, it manifests in different ways. So have you seen this in people that have actually, you know, achieved quite a lot and they still sit down and question Absolutely. themselves? Absolutely. I work with, um, I work with a lot of mm. athletes. I work with a lot of, um, you know, CEOs um, and, and scientists and also kind of social entrepreneurs around the world. And, you know, they're, they're the top of their game. I mean, you won't find these people anywhere that's really great at what they do. However, they also realize it, but it's just the acknowledgement and the feeling that, you know, I'm grateful for being who I am and I deserve this. That narrative is what's missing. And, and there could be many reasons for it. But, you know, a constant theme that pops up in uh, the manifestation of this is that the early childhood, you know, when they're growing up, They've been in an environment where they've had negatively reinforcing feedback, which later on manifests as uh, a narrative in your head saying you don't deserve Yeah, because there is like when you really read through and you see, um, there's like a lot of context behind it when you are abused or you're just told that in the terms of, you know, you're not great, you're not doing enough or you start hearing those things. And I, I, I significantly put that thing aside but yeah I'm, I'm happy that you brought it up. Nisreen, uh, to you I mean how do you think 
women overthink or do you think it's just a thing that I'm going to be coming back to that Andrew because sure. it's a very interesting question I I want want to ask him does he overthink but to you do you think women overthink uh, this you know term or has it been a thing that you know you kind of overthink and you put this syndrome onto you um in your views I'd love to know your thoughts yeah, so like I I had mentioned to you I I hadn't really heard that term imposter syndrome too much in around the people you know i associate with including the you know um the men in and around what's successful as well so i was just thinking to myself do you do i do i think that do i introspect and think that you know i don't deserve but to be honest i don't think there has been ever a time when i have sat down and thought you know i don't deserve it because i know that i worked very hard for where i am um uh because it was a very intellectual kind of feel and uh maybe it helped so picking up something that Ananjay said my childhood uh, the way my parents dealt with us and it was um uh myself and my two brothers was that it was never about getting being first second third in class or benchmarking against someone else the only question they would ever ever ask us be it for, uh, in relation to sports or academics was did you do the best you could do if you've done that that's it right so my my father or mother would never worry too much about whether we were first second third in class they didn't care actually they didn't care and i'm not just saying that for the sake of saying it so that gave us a lot of confidence as we were growing up not to question ourselves too much other than putting a very high benchmark for ourselves so we set our benchmark it was not about measuring myself against someone else or whatever <clears throat> so in that context as i went up the rung and you know achieved what were successes i have it was because I worked towards it. So there was never a question. Yes, there were times when you were in the right place at the right time and things came your way, right? And also there were times when you know you you wanted something but it was not the right time or you were in the wrong place. That could happen as well. But it was never where I questioned myself saying I was not capable or it was because something lacking in me that I didn't get it. So I honestly I I've not encountered it in my context and thinking of the other ladies that i worked with maybe because we are more technocrats i don't know um but i don't think any of them if i asked them the question would think you know i don't deserve where i am most probably they might actually say that i should have gotten here faster rather than not deserving it so it's slightly different perspective to that's fantastic to actually hear moving to you minoli being in a real estate um, industry and which is a male dominant industry as we know how is your self doubting thoughts like i i've had this chat with you and i would like to you so that you would also get to know a little bit more because it's fantastic to see this perspective and then uh, that andre's perspective over it and we'd like to hear yours okay so just to uh, recap of how i started off <laughs> um so uh actually in 2010 uh our capital trust was a, a primarily a stock broking company so uh i actually started the real estate arm in 2010 with one employee and we started the transactional arm by then no one knew the word uh, jll or what they did or any global agents by then so this was uh, something uh you know i had a passion for and i uh, you know went for that right uh, along the way uh, i felt that since it was so male oriented it was not regulated there was like lot of uh, you know uh, you know there were things that were happening uh you know certain transactions were not going because it was getting bypassed you know since it's not regu- regulated so that actually was uh sort of you start doubting are you in the correct industry right so i think that is i don't know if that is called this uh, you know the syndrome that uh, you're calling it we but we have been where she you know you sit down and you think about it and yeah. also you know when you have baby steps in your journey and you don't really see it then but then when you come to a certain point you start looking back and then 
and i think i was in all male dominated fields because i started off much before that at the shipping industry where i was one of the uh, i mean uh, at musk where i was one of the primary employees there so i started uh, in the financial field right so there it was 99% male oriented so in real estate also it was male oriented and i built that to a state where now we work with three global agents and uh, i have done transactions that are like uh, you know uh, that i have uh, changed the entire sphere of real estate so we do most of the transactions right now and uh, i also had the capital trust holdings uh, certain sectors so now i do the expansion for the securities in terms of market expansion stuff like that yeah um getting back to you then anje like i said i'd like to ask you this question do you think men are overthinkers in any way i think if you have a certain amount of uh, i mean it really depends on the depth of how your introspection is sweet is looking at you like that <laughs> <great. laughs> <laughs> better have yeah, this is going to be yeah, interesting you yeah. better have a good yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think overthinking is a manifestation of a deep back right i think there are some people you know if you have a strong introspection if you have a strong uh, self awareness you can see this manifestation of overthinking happening but if it's not that depth if you're not very introspective if you don't really kind of have that emotional aptitude uh, and awareness about you know you don't you don't think about things right mm-hmm. um and i think uh, it really connects to what your base attributes are and you know it affects you in different ways mm-hmm. um for example we talked Nizreen was talking about you know one manifestation is lack of you know you don't feel you deserve it. another manifestation of impostor syndrome is that halfway through your career you realize like well, what am i doing right uh you know you could be a ceo you could be a coach a teacher and you're like you know my job has no meaning right i'm not contributing to society and you go into this self narrative of you know literally looking at your whole life you know body of work and saying you know i've not done anything i've been an impostor throughout my life and that's also a consequence of overthinking it right if you overthink something to a certain degree you find nothing right and and part of becoming you know part of diagnosing yourself as impostor syndrome can be because of that and a lot of people actually do that yeah i was just going to ask you like do you have people come up to you and say look man i'm just thinking that you know i'm doubting this investment and they're talking about you know it could be like i mean millions or whatever and i i think uh, you'd get what i'm trying to say where you coach these people you try to tell them okay um yeah i mean you can take a risk but you cannot take a risk but they also start self doubting their perspective behind it how do you handle that like um, i do i think in this particular case whether in the two types of individuals i work with are a lot of professionals who are at the top of their game but they don't see the meaning in their job mm-hmm. right they've they've literally feel that uh they've lost the passion for their job and therefore they extrapolate it backwards or These are say, young people that you're talking about. Is um uh, not necessarily young. I think they're kind of mid-age to, you know, senior level executives and you know they have all the money in the world, they have all the stuff in the world, but they've lost connection with their purpose. Right? Um and that, then then they work back and that that lack of that purpose is filled by a narrative saying, "Hey, you've been an imposter throughout your life." Right? Uh and the second group of people that I work with are people who are taking their career from local to global. right so you're ex- you're industry expert in your area your country and now you're going into a global audience and now you st- it's not you doubt your doubt your skill you doubt the fact whether you can create an outcome in a different environment right like so you, so for example if you're indian or maybe a pakistani or a sri lankan or asian now you're going and speaking or trying to lead a company in netherlands or uh, in uh, germany right and you know you we come from a era of being colonized right and you have this mindset that you know white people are superior than brown people now suddenly you're like who am i to go and lead a group of white people in the middle of europe right have uh, you ever felt that who me yeah of course i have like i think when i when i went from uh, i'm trying to narrow to, the walls down a little bit yeah, yeah, yeah. from regional <laughs> to when i started speaking in europe and in the us mm mm-hmm. I think the narrative was there predominantly. Yeah, I was like, why would white people listen to me? And, and it's a myth you need to bust by doing it, 
right? So, and after a while, when you start getting feedback and when you start, you know, one of the beauty, beauty of trial and error is you realize everybody's fundamentally the same irrespective of your skin color, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, so you get, uh, get over that syndrome or get over that mindset by really not, not only taking the risk, but getting the feedback at the end of the day. All right. Um, you, I mean, I would like to know your perspective behind it because I have uh, known people that have the imposter syndrome. It's very uh, interesting to see that, you know, you, you very firmly say that, no, I mean, I'm, I'm in my shoes and I'm running. I'm taking the lead. I would like to know, do you appreciate your baby steps, you know, from the time that you've started your career and now that you've grown to this person that is leading, um, you know, a group, a team. Um, how do you feel? Do you actually sit down to think about your baby steps and actually appreciate um, the factor that you've actually come through that journey and also question? Actually, in my case, it was a huge leap at the beginning and then the baby steps sort of came into play because I went from an accounts trainee to a director within six years at KPMG. So I was a director at 28. And uh, I was responsible for the tax compliances or tax planning for 50% of the listed companies in the country. So it, it came really fast. That is where I said that whilst I was capable, um, there was also luck involved. And I, this is not about me you know, questioning myself, but I think it happened too fast. I, I should have had that opportunity to take the baby steps because sometimes technically you may be there, but Maybe emotionally, is your emotional quotient there to take that kind of responsibility because people who were my bosses ended up reporting to me. So that's that's a challenging environment. But from then onwards, I think in my career, it's been, it's been an amazing journey, to be honest. I think throughout my career, things have been just thrown at me, which has taken me off outside my comfort zone. So I remember um, one was KPMG, you know, being promoted too fast and well I swam I didn't sink I swam so that was fine and then leaving uh, KPMG joining John Keels which was very different kind of culture so again you're like trying to figure out how do you sort of navigate this and then I was at one point in time told to go around the country and look for property it was like so out of my comfort zone it was nothing to do with tax but for me it was a challenge it was something new I should take on I did no clue about it but I think sometimes um, your supervisors also give you that comfort saying that, you know, you're intelligent, you'll figure it out. Take the risk, just go and get it done. So did that. Then two years later, I was told go to India and spend three years there. And um, there was, we were running a BPO there. So I was head of corporate functions for 700 people, all Indians. So about what you were saying. Um, and it was something I had absolutely no clue about because I was head of tax and here I was head of corporate functions, responsible for almost everything other than operations, cooperations. So it was a shift in terms of I was in, in, in my work area. I was, I think, technically one of the, you know, I was confident about my ability. But when I went to India, it was everything was new. Everything was a new learning. But that's where I think my childhood helped because I didn't put pressure on myself to say that I don't know. I went with the mindset that I don't know, so I'm here to learn. You didn't and really I told my team yeah. as well. I said, you know, guys, you guys know more than I do. So I'm going to learn from you. So if you're comfortable in your skin in that sense, I think the, the doubts don't creep up because you are quite comfortable telling them, you know, I don't know how this works. Please tell me or teach me how it works um, and just have confidence in your intellect to say that I'll figure it out and then when I came back to Sri Lanka again took over tax and then three years ago I was told take on corporate fine no actually two years after that I was told to take on plastic cycle which is a social entrepreneurship project again nothing I knew about took it on and then two years later I was told to take uh, corporate finance so it's always been someone saying just go and get it done and me trying to figure out okay how do I get it done so I actually didn't have too much of time for self-doubt because I was constantly learning and figuring out how to do things. So I did, maybe didn't have time to sit down and think, okay, have I got it there right or not? There is an interesting not? question that I have <laughs> lined up for you, but before that, I'll move <laughs> okay. to Minoli a little bit. Because you see, when you actually start self-doubting yourself, you also start thinking and try and also become like a perfectionist, right? So how does it feel to 
um, have a perfectionist around you or how okay. would you how would you take that as a positive impact so in my case it's a very different scenario where uh, I and my husband are in this business so uh, he's more into the securities while I I hit the real estate term and he is more a perfectionist while I am more opportunistic and more uh, a strategist okay. so um, actually when the stock markets were doing really badly we went into real estate correctly at the correct time and that was something that was uh, a very good thing for the group right so every move that i made was quite uh, you know a positive step for the company i think the results showed otherwise like you know when you are a when you have a male in in this uh, equation uh, in sri lanka i feel i was uh, having a chat with mr in also it's in asia i guess like you know you uh you know the the general public will praise the the male figure and uh, underestimate the female i'm sorry so, dananjay no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> that always happens in our society i feel because i studied in australia where i excelled in my education and then you know i excelled beyond the even the aussies and i you know it was like a like you know they would challenge me and then i would go ahead and challenge them <laughs> so that sort of person i was very pushy so even in the company like if i thought certain things have to be done i was very pushy for instance there were there was a you know a land that we had to acquire and it was in the middle of nowhere it was where actually the the cinema life was going to be uh, and 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 my husband was like what is this land why do you want to buy this i said no i was no. just going to ask you i mean how do you sit down and and risk all that and then suddenly you, you wait for it to happen and then so i have this i don't know intuition i i i have this passion for real estate and i know i could forward think what would happen in 3 or 4 years so i knew this land was going to be really precious and it will appreciate and i was like no i want it okay <laughs> and i uh, you know stood by it and uh, here we are like you know this huge development has come in the middle of it <laughs> so right. so those investments actually we did for the company that just uh, made uh, us now a conglomerate what we are all right so uh, we've also known that you know the imposter syndrome actually has a section where you can really reframe your conversation you can reframe your structure it's basically taking out like another old picture and having like a nice gold frame around it and you have a new story to tell about you know you have a new story to talk about it's basically in the cognitive science of psychology um i'd like to uh, pose this question to you how does it feel like if you had to reframe somebody in terms of coaching like how would it be yeah i think reframing happens a lot with just figuring out the fallacies and uh, the falseness in the assumptions that you all believe so we all have a set of assumptions that create our world view right and just drawing from what miloli minoli said and his reason we believe that confidence is an attribute to demonstrate skill which is not the case if you look at some of the greatest athletes in the world you know to be hussein bolt to michael phelps and you know whenever they go into the olympics i mean they're as nervous as you and i are right and so there is a fallacy there that confidence helps you demonstrate your skill better in fact there is may more empirical evidence that if you over confident you'll demonstrate it worse right so part of reframing is looking at the assumptions and really testing and seeing the deeper truth in those assumptions right so that we as a society we believe in assumptions right we like uh, hard you know practice makes you perfect is that true or this perfect practice make you so perfect. you're you're actually saying that it happens here hmm. no think about it right so we've all heard practice makes you perfect yes or this perfect practice make you perfect completely two different things 
right? If you practice something badly, you're going to be good at it badly. You're going to be the best in the world badly. But if you get a perfect practice, that's what leads to perfection. So that's the example of a fallacy that we believe in, right? Um, and for example, picking up from what, what Minoli said is that, you know, so the women, uh, you know, the women have a tougher time. Like women aren't celebrated when they do their hard work, right? Is that a truth? Or is that as a society, we have this crab mentality? and pulling down people and okay being a woman is just a manifestation of pulling down being black is a manifestation of pulling down right so you have a label you attach to a deep attitude that runs through society is that the truth so you investigate the truth and then you re when you figure out the fallacy that allows you to reframe yourself right and for you i mean like um uh, dananji just brought this up before i could even ask a question things like that but um opposite sex like you know i mean like you said it's more appreciative and when you've come across all this throughout your journey how have you overcome it and you're seated here to tell me the stories so i'd like to know a little bit more about it <laughs> so there was another instance i would tell you is that uh, we had this uh, huge uh, lease transaction that uh, we were going to do and uh, a huge mal I mean another sort of a, a global agent bypassed us right after a lot of like months and months of due diligence that we did uh, so I was like uh, I didn't know how this happened and I just asked my husband uh, what shall I do and he was just silent he didn't know what because this has happened over and over and he was just silent on what 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 uh, what I should do so I was like uh, you know I was I felt really hopeless where am I going to fall to and I thought no I was so motivated that I had done everything professionally I had acted ethically uh, I had done a lot of hard work and I was not going to give it up for unethicality in any way so I called India to the to my global agent as well as the multinational and I said how did this happen I mean I did the you know months and months of due diligence we chose the the locations how did this company just come and you know bypass us and 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 they understood and they understood that they couldn't go without us and uh, you know and they and the landlords gave in uh, the my global agent supported and I forged ahead so I, I think, think that's, that's when overthinking yeah. works yes. has to work because you're yes. like in it and you're like I'm and you're, a, motivated, you're motivated you're motivated I want to and do I it. think women have that because because they have to mm -hmm. work extra hard to do that do you hear because, that <laughs> you know <laughs> do you hear that yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean I challenged and and that global agent just told me I mean this has never been done before you have done something that in India they used to bulldoze us, you know, this company bulldoze us through and wow. you've done something that is incredible. Fantastic. So, so those are the things that uh, I think really pulled you through. Miss Reen, for you, like uh, since your perspective on this topic is very different, I'd like to know if you see somebody in your team, you've um, maybe it would happen now. In the future. I most probably observe it better, I guess. Yes. Yeah. But how, would you s let it be stagnant and uh, not, you know, tease the brain to see, you know, what it brings? Or would you have a chat and say, okay, you know, this is, there is something like this. And you're just being an imposter, you know, where you suddenly come out of it. Or would you just, you know, ignore and not talk about it because you want to bring that aspect and just want them to be just like you? See, I think <clears throat> maybe we are overthinking it also like, you know, Nanancha said. So I think every, all of us, so I'm not saying that I haven't had self-doubt, but I'm not putting a label on it and mm. creating mm. a issue, like mm. making it a, like a bigger than it yes. needs to be. Right? There are, I mean, always you, you, it may not be technical skills, but it may be soft skills. You know, mm. you, you do question yourself, but not in terms of doubting myself. It doesn't get to that level. So if I'm dealing with any one of my uh, team members, be it male or female, and mind you, you know, these kind of doubts, I think one of the fallacies is that only women sort of have this. Mm. So 
and this happens even now you know sometimes i push people you know beyond their comfort zones and they're like you know can i do it or um should i or could i kind of thing and it's it's about i share my own experiences so that they get comfort from that but beyond that i i, I tell them unless you sort of go beyond that stop question yourself worst that can happen is you'll fail but that's a learning as well right so it's okay it's okay as long as you've tried your best it goes back to my childhood thing as long as you've tried your best no one can find fault with you i will back you up right just give them that confidence to explore things and also to make mistakes because that's how you learn you can't do things perfectly all the time so i think i'm not even going to say that it's my female team members or male team members anyone who comes to me with doubt and they will that's that's part of my role as as their you know mentor as a well um i think it's to acknowledge that it's fine to have that doubt but let's not overthink it let's figure out how do we overcome it in terms of what is in, within your control right and and just just there at a time you know don't take it one step at a one time one step at a time okay. as i said there is always silver lining nananja to you i mean with uh, with what uh, nisreen adds yeah. i mean there comes a question if you have a person that you have to coach and yeah. this person comes to you and says like i told you before like you yeah. know i've got this and now i'm self doubting myself but also i don't want to talk about it and is that something that you like to think about on t- in terms of image building and you know is it like a healthy image building that you want to do and hush them up to say you know rather not talk about it um well, you know I'll, I'll kind of reclassify that like the, the kind of leaders that I work with they know that there is a problem mm-hmm. right they I think they acknowledge there's a broad acknowledgement of what the issue is mm-hmm. the problem is they don't have a more constructive narrative to see themselves in in their current situation so my my work really revolves around working with leaders to look at an alternate narrative to help them become better leaders and and accomplish what they want to accomplish and i go back to kind of bring him back to what uh, minoli talked about is also kind of helping them see different truths it's not that one is false and another is true different truths now you pointing back at what you told me you looked at me and said we men work harder right okay it is true but also do male farmers in ampara who kind of plow their land for 18 hours a day that is also true but women tea pluckers in nuralia who pluck tea also work hard that is also true so there are multiple truths but what we do is because we have a bias we need to justify the situation we are in we pick a truth that fits our narrative are we telling ourselves a story that's right we do tell ourselves a story okay. and we conveniently pick the truth that aligns with our bias mm. so a lot of my work revolves around helping people see other truths this is true but hey here are a couple of other truths and that's when you can kind of reframe yourself all right so i mean that's exactly what i i mean you know with a thick belt around you where you coach these people it's an interesting question to ask you mistreen walking back to you um i mean how how would it feel like you have a person seated right in front of you that says hey no i've gone through this mm-hmm. you know i know it and somebody comes to you and says you know nisreen i've got this problem and uh, i need questions uh, uh, to be answered and you very beautifully said you know i just help them and tell them to take one step at a time but as a leader sometimes these questions need to be answered there and then but then do you take your role back to taking it on a personal note or just you know sit down with them and speak to them in terms of their role and their you know their their results with whatever they're going through i'm just trying to think through think back to an instance where that could have happened and it did um it's to be honest it's it's i don't have a, like a answer that's a cookie cutter answer i think it will all depend on what kind of person mm-hmm. that person is um how deep that doubt is um is it temporary or is this something coming from a deep rooted you know like you know childhood concern or whatever so i i i think just because i haven't had it doesn't mean someone else cannot have it right mm-hmm. uh i have been lucky in my life and in my career so I know this whole syndrome is also about not saying to yourself that you've been lucky but in my context it's it's in a different uh, mm-hmm. way that I'm saying it 
but I think for everyone, what they are going through is their truth. And I think Dananjay also said that. So it's about understanding because you don't have to experience everything to be able to empathize, right? Because I mean, no one can have all experience so that you can deal with all situations. So it's about maybe trying to put yourself in that place and saying, okay, if I was there, how would I have dealt with it? Uh, and maybe suggest things because I don't have the right answer. Are I don't you think going to, Are you going to try and dissociate yourself and then enjoy the moment? That's why you, you say take one step at a time. Enjoy mm -hmm. the journey. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Rather than just overthinking and you know, putting yourself into the shell where you're, all, you're already losing a lot. In the it's, sense. Again, as I said, it's, it's, it depends on the circumstance, right? right? So if it's a doubt that I can take away from them mm -hmm. as their supervisor, I will try and do that because that makes the journey easier. Right. If it's something that I, it's not within my control, then, then I would say something like that to say, you know, maybe it's not within anyone's control. So just take a step at a time. And there is always, if you work hard at something and if you truly believe that you have done your best, then you own it. Don't doubt it. Just own it, whatever the outcome is. It may not be perfect. It may not be what someone else expects of you, mm -hmm. but set your own boundaries, set your own benchmarks, set your, uh, uh, chart your own journey, right? If you do that, then the doubts will, I think, become lesser and lesser and lesser, where you would at some point in time, like look back and say, you know, I'm happy. I'm happy with what I've done. Are you happy now? with the journey that you've really come through? Yes, I do. Uh, because I have, uh, I think, learned to uh, be, you know, I have just forged ahead, so. And overcome so, so all overcome of that. all of that, uh, yes. Ananji, I mean, if you have somebody that comes up to you and says, look, I mean, um, there is like, I mean, there's somebody seated True. right next to you and she says True. that, you know, I, I think I've never gone through it. Yeah. I mean, and you start identifying issues, right? And this person you're coaching, right? How would you, how would you, let's just role play a little bit and say, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I want to use a different type of language. I think, I think coaching is generally characterized with this concept of identifying mm -hmm. issues. I, 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 it's not necessarily that you identify issues, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's Nizreen, a typical conversation would go as, hey Nizreen, you know, what do you want to achieve in the next mm -hmm. 10 years of your life? Who do you want to be? What's the, what's the ecosystem you want to be operating in? What's the lifestyle? So I, I need a very thorough understanding of mm -hmm. what she wants versus what she needs. Right? It's like two different things, right? You can fall in love with an idea. Right? I want to be the president of Sri Lanka. I love the idea, right? But is it what I need? Right? It's completely two different things. So once you identify what you need, then it's a matter of talking with Nizreen and understanding what are her mental constructs? What are the constructive stories? What are the destructive stories? And it's about working with Nizreen to reframe the destructive stories in a more constructive way. Right, so I think it's it's more than a, more than an issue solution perspective. It's mm -hmm. more of hey, what did what is the story that will get you to where you want to go, and then pooling the evidence around it to help that person believe in that story. That's kind of what what my approach is all about. And you'll tell her. You'll tell I her. wouldn't tell her. It's something that she. <laughs> that's what I'm trying I, to get out yeah. because so, so that, you that, can't that, tell that, a that, person. That's that's that's, so that's the difference. There's a difference in see. If you tell somebody something, then it doesn't become a truth. Yeah. So they realize, it, they internalize the truth and then they start to believe in the story. And then they see the difference between what I believe versus what I believe now. And my role is more towards guiding them towards that journey. And it's natural for people who come to ask, hey, tell me what my problem is. Give me a solution. That is exactly what you shouldn't do. And that leads to instant gratification, but it doesn't lead to change. Right. So you also, I mean, you, you speak, like you said, I mean, you speak to a lot of people um, outside yeah. Sri Lanka. Yeah. And you also brought in the fact that, you know, we, I think here, right. do this certain thing where we start, you know, talking about ourselves and tell ourselves a story, yeah. self-doubt ourselves. But what about the people outside Sri Lanka? Do they have the same conversations with you? No, or? It's, it's, it's the same thing. They, they, everybody has a story. Now, when mm. I say story, it's not only a story of self-doubt. There are people who have stories of 
incredible that are incredibly egotistic. They believe there's nothing wrong with them, mm. right? And oh, yet, sorry, I'm not like worried now. <laughs> <laughs> not, 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 not in not in not in any way. What is real? Are you are you going to but say that? I'm in, I'm in denial then. No, 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 not at all. I, I think maybe a better way to articulate it is kind of like if you you know there are personalities that are completely oblivious to any form of vulnerability. right mm. uh, and those are very dangerous stories because you actually believe you can do things and get away with it without any consequences so it's not always a story of lack of confidence mm-hmm. it's not whether the story is good or bad is your story productive to take you to where you want to go that's the right way to look at a internal narrative and an internal story and depending on where you want to go that story can be extremely in in a extreme or balanced in the middle right so for example if you want to be the greatest uh, uh athlete in the world let's say yeah. the swimmer in the world right mm-hmm. and you know there is no balanced life there you can't have a narrative of a balanced life because greatness and failure are two extremes at both extremes you have sacrifice if you want to get to the 0.001% of your craft you've got to sacrifice there is no balanced life So if you have a narrative of hey I want to live a balanced life that's going to be absolutely not constructive to get you where you want to get to. Conversely, there might be somebody who who wants a balanced life but is overcompensating saying I need to work 24 hours a day to get there but that's not what that's what they want but what they need is a balanced life. Then it's about changing the narrative. So since it's about women's day I would like to ask a question that's just out there. I mean I, and everybody would also ask this question like How is is anyone you know in your life Nazreen that has always inspired you other than your mom or your siblings anybody that always has been because I've got I think I've got 2 3 uh, that I would not want to name but <laughs> <laughs> actually it's not my okay my mom is one person who has inspired me but uh, my grandmother actually she was from a village in India so like I'm Okay, second generation Indian. <clears throat> so she got married late in life. She was 23 and that was considered late in life. She left her country, came here, and she brought up nine children, right? She was not educated. She could not read. She made sure all nine children were educated, right? Um they were not financially secure, but they never went hungry. And I remember her as a person who was always very calm. right she she had this inner strength that you know it was amazing i mean i have never seen a person like that and she they used to live in kandy and i think like in in our language um, you call mother ma right everyone who knew her used to call her ma her children her nephews nieces whoever it may be would call her ma and she had gone through tough times in life but she always would be smiling she it, it, i i don't know what it was about her but i think this positivity of mm. always thinking things will work out mm. maybe i've just seen her as i grew up and she i don't think she ever dwelled on things that were not going well but always looked at what was the positive positive aspect, side yeah. of it so i think it's a bit of that in me as well that i have seen um and to be honest i mean i have met a lot of professional women i have met a lot of successful women who made lot of money who maybe have had very successful marriages whatever but i think she stands out for me as someone i would aspire to be like what about you than andre Role model wise would definitely be my mom. Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I think def. I mean, not to, not to say I that. said no, other than your mom. I am completely comfortable yes. being around, uh, <laughs> being around strong women. I come from a family of strong women and a very matriarchal uh, uh, family, right? As opposed to very patriarchal. I think uh, you know my wife is an entrepreneur. Um, you know she's, uh, you know. Have to say the wife also to balance. Absolutely, I mean, I mean, and, and, and a complete rest. She's an entrepreneur. She's you know the mother of my three kids. You know, she's a partner to me, and then I draw very similarly with my mom because my mom's an entrepreneur as well, right? Mm. Whereas um, you know all of the entrepreneurial spirit that I have, and I still wish I could be half what my mom is because you know really uh, my understanding of what you know strength is from the feminine perspective really came from my mom. You know, the male perspective was all, always there. 
right from my school upbringing and so on but then the real female favor really came from my mom you know my wife uh, you know strong aunts and uh, you know around so really comfortable being with strong women so sometimes when i the the flip side of it is when sometimes when women come and say look i'm having a tough time in a male dominated world i can't relate to it okay. because i come from a family right. of strong women and i they never had any problem managing situations You're like okay what, what is, how, does <laughs> yeah, it, how does that feel i i, I do have that issue. how does that feel yeah yeah correct what about you minoli I'll have to say the same it is actually like the same uh, like <laughs> okay because they actually taught me the right values uh you know i think that from the from a very young childhood they used to tell you know uh you have to no racism you know all those correct values are very important i think mm-hmm. towards what you build up to be I'm going to completely and there are exceptions but I'm going to generalize this right I think one of the permeating qualities of strong women right is this endurance right my my, my mom is 76 and she's now still at it yes. you know whereas you know whereas she has so much of energy yeah right she would and, you know and, look after um, my children the second part of this is kind of whereas men after a certain age they kind of like get yeah. wind down yeah. they're like <laughs> that I got up that you know like okay, this is where the cigar where is the and they're like completely going to retire they go into that den right and and that's kind of that I'm really I, hoping the dads don't see this today <laughs> no but <laughs> I said I I I stayed away from my parents because that was your brief so I I need to acknowledge <laughs> just one thing I okay. think one thing my parents did really well and I think because of that I respect them mm-hmm. a lot is that from a very early age and this was like half a century ago i'm 50 now right so um during that whole period they never irrespective of what was happening around my brothers and i were always treated alike right so there was ne- this gender equality never even hit me yes. until yes. like uh, people yeah. started talking about it so i never thought of myself in the context of being female right i was just me right um that was one and the second like i said earlier is about never benchmarking me against in, or any mm-hmm. of us against someone else right so it was never about being the best amongst this it's about being the best you can be can be right so that took actually a lot of pressure off us and also conversely put a lot of pressure on us because you couldn't fudge anymore right because right. you the only question you're going to be asked is did you do the best you could and if you haven't then that's on you right so um so i think it's we've had good people around us i think the bottom line is that also to begin the last part of it is you said it's on you right i think just and i do this with my kids it's like you know, failing is okay Yeah it's okay like, there is yeah, a yeah. difference between failing and becoming a failure yeah. I I yeah. think that's you the whole, learn from yes yeah. you are you know so I, I think, think that's the whole I mean it's a great conversation that we've had we've had three different perspectives um and we've come to um a statement where we're saying that it's okay to fail right and it's okay to keep trying and it's okay to keep telling yourself stories and also reframing yourselves as a personality if you have to and just step back up. I think all three of us most probably have failures that we can talk about. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So thank you so much guys and I hope that you guys actually had a fantastic time yeah, and yeah. Uh, I hope that our people would actually get some of this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.